Well, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we are live back again. Uh, welcome to History Class, live from the woods, uh, out back of my abode here on the Fulcher Ranch. Uh, so, uh, today, uh, on our last video, we talked about uh, the war with the Germans. Now we're going to shift our attention to the war against the Japanese. So when we last left off with that particular conflict, uh, the Japanese had the advantage up until uh, the, tw you know, the two back-to-back -back American victories at Coral Sea and Midway. So you start off with, um, you know, about a year of the Japanese kind of kicking our tail in the Pacific. Some of that was because America had to bring a lot of our forces to bear on the German war immediately because Britain uh, and France and the other allies were kind of tapped to, uh, severely and in, in real danger of losing uh, very quickly if we didn't focus our attention over there. So even though Japan is the one who picks the fight with us directly, we send most of our troops over to fight Germany right away just because of the military necessity. So because of that, the, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. is a little bit undermanned in, in the Pacific. Uh, do understand a lot of the Pacific is naval warfare. There's a lot of sea battles. There's a lot of air battles that are fought using Navy planes. Um, however, uh, you know, we'll see there were quite a few battles on land as well. They were mainly carried on by the Marine Corps. So most of the battles in the European theater of operations uh, involved uh, Army. Uh, most of the land battles in uh, the Pacific involved the Marine Corps. And it is in the Pacific that the Marine Corps has some of its most famous engagements at places like Iwo Jima, like Guadalcanal. Uh, like Okinawa, and we're going to talk about those today. So when we let kind of the, the turning point, <clears throat> uh, so the turning point uh, today, uh, the turning point of uh, the uh, of the war in the Pacific was uh, the Battle of Midway that followed closely on the heels of the Battle of Coral Sea, where four Japanese-American aircraft carriers are taken out. Aircraft carriers were a vitally important part of um, uh, military warfare uh, in the Pacific uh, because, you know, in, because they would carry uh, these bombers and fighters and so this boat would carry it. It would be like, a, it was like a floating runway ship. Uh, if you've never seen one. So uh, taking out four aircraft carriers was a huge, huge deal and significantly diminished the Japanese Navy's ability to control the waters. Japan, again, is, a, is an island, is a nation that's a confederation, not a confederation, but it's a union of several islands. Um, and uh, so uh, from that point on, so uh, from that point on, Japan could no longer push further out in their attempt at conquest uh, they, they had to give up on the dream of conquering Australia and New Zealand and some of those places that they had initially coveted. Uh, and now they have to turn their attention to trying to protect the Japanese home islands. Let me turn and see if I can get this a little out of the sun here for you. The sun's being unpredictable. <sighs> Are we balanced? We're not balanced enough right now. Hold on. Okay. All right. So, I'm sorry. You're just going to have to deal with the glare because I don't know how to fix it. All right. So... Uh, so General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, uh, is the man in charge of the the Pacific War, uh, and and he, he is actually Army personnel. Um, but uh, he develops a strategy known as island hopping, which sounds like something really fun that you would do listening to Jimmy Buffett. Uh, but that's not what it what it was. Trust me, island hopping was not fun. Uh, so what was the strategy of island hopping? The strategy of island hopping is, is this, that uh, there's literally thousands of islands in the Pacific uh, that the Japanese had, uh, you know, gained control or whatever. He said, we can't stop and liberate every single island, uh, but we'll go, we'll bypass the ones that we need to, uh, but go to uh, get as many islands as we can that'll get us and our airplanes a little bit closer to the Japanese home islands. And so we had to strategically decide what islands to fight for. And some of them, if, honestly, if you look at them, you'd think they were weird choices, like the Battle of Iwo Jima, which is probably the nast one of the nastiest battles of the war. Uh, 
um, you know, was uh, a island that was basic, virtually uninhabited. You know, just a little, you know, little piece of rock in the Pacific. Uh, it's a sulfuric island, so it literally smelt like sulfur the whole time. The problem was, uh, or the reason we felt it was necessary was because of its location, and in, we thought if we took the air base that was there, you know, we could send planes a little bit closer to being able to start threatening the Japanese home islands. Um, and so, so this is a strategy that we uh, embark on. Um, one of uh, the last major battle before um, the island hopping strategy really took took place, I should mention this, was the Battle of Guadalcanal, which the Battle of Guadalcanal was vicious, vicious fighting. Um, another one of these places where it would have smelled really bad. Um, a, a lot of these South Pacific islands, there was extreme amounts of, like, mosquitoes and other things carrying disease. It was very easy to get sick when you were fighting in the Pacific. Um, uh, many of them were... Uh, some of the battles were uh, were in extremely hot conditions. Others of them were actually cold. It just kind of depended where you were um, in the Pacific. But some of these South Pacific battles, you have you know oppressive heat and humidity in tropical climates. Uh, so Guadalcanal goes down in the Solomon Islands. That's about 3,000 miles from Tokyo. Uh, the Japanese abandoned the island though in February of 1943, and then we kind of begin the island hopping strategy. Uh, and so. Uh, we used the kind of the uh, planes that we used uh, the most were the B-29 Super Fortress and the B-17 Flying Fortress, which were the bomber planes we were trying to drop on the Japanese. And, uh, you know, and even before, we'll talk about the famous atomic bomb at the end of the day, but uh, even before the atomic bomb happens, we had really done a lot of bombing of the Japanese. We did some a lot of bombing of the Germans, too, like in the city of Dresden, famously. Uh, but we did a lot of firebombing on the city of Tokyo, which uh, a lot of these Japanese cities were still wood uh, buildings. You know, a lot of them were not, uh, you know, uh, metal and concrete and so forth. They were still they were still kind of built out of, of lumber. And so, uh, because of that, firebombing could be very devastating for those regions. Uh, there's actually one kind of harebrained scheme that that they actually tried to put together. Um, was uh, they actually developed a weapon that uh, called uh, called the bat bomb uh, that uh, like had bats in a cage with a chemical that would then they would like the idea was to like release them uh, and the, in the release the chemical would light on fire the bat would start freaking out and just flopping from rooftop to rooftop and burn down every building that he came across uh, seems like it may have been influenced a little bit by Samson tying the fox's tails together and, and setting them on fire in, in the Book of Judges. So, um, anyway, it was, uh, it was a strange attempt. I don't know that I don't know if it was ever deployed, but scientists really were c considering the, the possibility. Um, and uh, wh one thing I should say too about a lot of these battles, we also use what they call uh, a PT or mosquito boat, which are these kind of really small uh, boats as well. Um, were also kind of used in in various. Uh, battles here in the Pacific Front. So, um, we had, uh, in 1944, there's a number of significant fighting in the Mariana Islands, which is a uh, island chain that involves, uh, Saipan and Guam. Um, there's a, uh, so Saipan and Guam are both, you know, very vicious land battles, but you also have a major air and naval battle, uh, that happened in between with airplanes taking off of, uh, aircraft carriers, uh, and we had a new plane called the Hellcat uh, made its debut uh, in uh, there, and they knocked out 346 Japanese warplanes from the sky, uh, and uh, Americans began to call the Battle of the Marianas the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Um, and so once we captured the Marianas, we now were in range to start the bombing of the Japanese home islands, which is kind of the beginning of the end. Um, we also want to regain control of the Philippines, which had been an American colony uh, before uh, the Japanese took it. Now, we're, we're going to give the Philippines their independence uh, after war is out, but 
uh, in, in the short run, we want to regain the Philippines from Japanese control. If you remember, the Philippines was the side of, you know, MacArthur disappeared and said, I, you know, had to leave and said, I shall return, his famous declaration. And then, um, you know, you had the infamous um, Bataan Death March where a lot of American soldiers were uh, forcibly marched at Bayonet Point to POW camps and killed along the way. So uh, the uh, the highlight of the uh, the reconquest of the Philippines is the Battle of Leyte Gulf, which is the largest naval battle in history, uh, and it's a major blow to the naval and air forces of Japan. The Japanese lost three battleships, nine cruisers, ten destroyers, and 180 aircraft. Um, and it is in the aftermath of Leyte Gulf that Japan gets desperate because. Uh, o over the course of the series of Allied victories leading up to it, they had lost control of a lot of their oil supply because uh, oil's not really native to Japan, so they were relying on foreign conquest to provide uh, their oil. And uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, basically their ability to stage a conventional naval and air war had been uh, greatly diminished. So what they did was they developed um, uh, they developed a strategy known as the kamikaze idea. And world history students, hopefully you remember from earlier in the year, that the kamikaze in Japanese history, it was a Japanese term that meant divine wind, and it was in reference to the typhoon that destroyed the invading Mongols when Geng Genghis Khan's uh, forces attempted an invasion of Japan back in medieval times. And, uh, you know, the monsoon took out the, the Mongol navy before they could make a landfall uh, on Japan, prevented the Mongol conquest of Japan. Uh, and so the Japanese uh, Shintoist, uh, that's the Japanese religion, uh, began to call it uh, the kamikaze, or the wind of God, or divine wind. And so uh, when they started calling uh, these pilots kamikaze pilots, they were trying to appeal to a sense of, of pride and heritage and saying that you are going to be uh, for modern Japan, what the typhoon was to medieval Japan, that you are going to defend your homeland from the American invader the same way that your forefathers, you know, were defended by the wind from the Mongol invader. And what the kamikaze was, was literally a pilot that, uh, they flew one way. Uh, they didn't even uh, come with enough gasoline to make it back. Uh, they they were running low on ammo, they were running low on bombs, they were running low on guns, so what they started to do is just use the plane as a bomb, uh, and they would just, uh, they would just send these, these soldiers would know, or the pilots would know they were, you know, committing suicide, uh, in doing so, they were sacrificing their life, but they, uh, began to, you know, go one way in these airplanes and just tried to crash them into, uh, American naval ships, uh, American aircraft, uh, you know, and the idea was, you know, if you get, if you get one kamikaze plane that just goes headlong into, you know, just blows itself up in the side of an air, you know, of a battleship or an aircraft carrier, you know, you know, uh, it's possible that the, you know, the Americans lose a lot more from that, uh, than the Japanese do in losing one man and one ship. So, um, so the kamikaze thing was obviously a sign of desperation, uh, but, uh, you know, it also was a case of the Americans are still trying to preserve their stuff. The Japanese had reached the point where they don't care about maintaining their stuff because they don't have enough stuff to win in the first place, uh, and, and also started to care less about maintaining, uh, you know, the, the lives of the pilot, because... Yeah, uh, so, with that, the kamikaze became a kind of a dreaded thing. This is now a good time to stop and talk about how, you know, one thing that really separated uh, the Japanese from any other army in the world at the time was the way the Japanese culture handled the idea of surrender. Which is to say that they didn't. It had been a part of Japanese culture since... Uh, I mean, from the early days, that surrender is just not a thing that's done. Um, if you go back to the days of the samurai and the uh, and the days of the shogun and, and all that stuff in feudal Japan, 
Um, part of the Bushido, or the way of the, of the warrior in Japanese culture, uh, was refusal to admit defeat, and that if you were defeated, if you did fail at your mission, what was expected of the samurai was to fall on his own sword. They literally would drive the sword through their own gut. It was what they called seppuku. Uh, it was an act of ritual suicide, and the reason they did it was because the Japanese culture is was very collectivistic and very much geared toward uh, the idea of shame and honor, uh, and, it was, and the idea of shame and honor was very much geared toward... Um, uh, respect for the ancestors. So, uh, because they, their culture just doesn't think as individualistically as we do. So we think of it as like, we failed, okay, oh, that sucks. We failed, we feel bad about it. we failed. But in their culture, if you fail, it's not that you failed, it's that you failed your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather and your great-grandfather, and really, the, and really the whole nation of Japan. So uh, because of that, you know, Japan wouldn't surrender until we dropped not one, but two atomic bombs, as we'll talk about. Uh, and so that was what was, that's the kind of drastic steps that were necessary to override their cultural predilection to never ever quit. And so because of that, and we'll see how this plays into to battles like Okinawa and, and Guadalcanal and Oka, uh, Iwo Jima. Uh, I mean, it didn't matter if you got them into a bad spot. They were just going to fight and fight and fight. And so one of two things happens. It's kind of an interesting thing. If you study... I'm always kind of interested in history, like the way it was perceived at the time versus how we perceived it later. If you go back and study like war materials and or like the things that were uh, not war materials, but like the primary sources of the war, you'll notice one of two attitudes towards the Japanese. Um, I suppose they were both racist in a way, but there's one that was like really racist in a very obvious way and and treated the Japanese as as inhuman or subhuman monsters, you know, uh, where, um, you know, in a way that, I mean, they would make fun of the, you know, they would call the Germans krauts and look down on them, but, you know, the, but the Japanese were treated differently than the German soldiers. They were treated as, by many in, in the first camp as being kind of less than human, and you notice, if you see depictions of Japanese soldiers in cartoons or comic books or stuff like that of, of the era, uh, political cartoons, uh, you know, you'll see they're often drawn with kind of uh, rodent-like features and stuff like that. Um, you know, pardon me for saying this, but there, there's a famous uh, Superman cover uh, where uh, Superman is slapping a Japanese soldier in the face, and the caption says, um, Hey, kids, you can slap a Jap by buying war bonds. <laughs> so, I mean, just, again, very racist. I don't mean to offend anybody. Uh, you know, that, I'm just telling the, the history of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so there was that very, like, kind of racist version of, of how the Japanese were depicted. The other kind was the people that so looked up to the Japanese that it was almost like they almost treated them as though they were not subhuman, but superhuman. Like, who are they? Like, they're obviously not the same as us, but who are these people that never quit or, and, and are unstoppable? You know, so uh, there are some, uh, you know, American soldiers kind of walked away from the war, you know, with deep prejudice against the Japanese. There are others that walked away with, you know, deep admiration and almost feeding into kind of like a mythical view of them. And so, uh, so anyway, and that plays out uh, in a number of battles, one of the most famous uh, being the Battle of Iwo Jima, which is uh, probably the most famous battle of the Pacific Front. Uh, how many of you, it's, I'm asking questions like you can answer me, uh, but I'm sure most of you have at some point, uh, I'm sure it's in your textbook at, at some somewhere. If not, you've seen it. I'm sure you know the picture of you know four Marines hoisting an American flag on the top of a hill. Uh, well, that photograph was actually kind of a, a recreation photograph. It, it did happen, but they they kind of posed after the fact. But um, but that uh, photograph, which became a famous statue and a bunch of other things, uh, was at the end of a long battle uh, which involved one charge where hundreds of Japanese were involved in the battle and, uh, you know, and, and hundreds of Americans in this particular skirmish within the battle. And at the end of it, 27 Americans survived and zero Japanese, not for the whole battle of Iwo Jima, but for that particular engagement uh, within the battle. Um, so there are parts of, there are parts of the, the uh, Pacific War, including at Iwo Jima, uh, where, I mean, 
where there were skirmishes where the Japanese literally fought to the last man with no one surrendering. And oftentimes, they would give themselves up like as they were dying. Sometimes they would booby trap their bodies so that if Americans did try to, like, you know, give them any kind of burial, they would pull off a mine and they would blow up or something like that. So, um, so Iwo Jima, one of the, uh, the harshest... Uh, condition battles that you'll ever see. Uh, the the battle was fought for the sake of gaining control of an airfield, uh, uh, like many of these battles. Um, it was literally it was a volcanic island with a bunch of caves on it. I mean, it's not it's not green grass. It's not pretty beaches. I mean, it's 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 like volcanic rock and caves, uh, and it literally smells like sulfur. Um, so imagine. Uh, you know, just imagine the smell of deviled eggs on steroids, just everywhere, and it's humid, and it's nasty, and there's mosquitoes, um, uh, oh, and you're, you know, in a fight to the death with guns and grenades and all this kind of stuff. Um, so 21,000 Japanese defenders, uh, 6,800 American soldiers were killed, 20,000 Americans were wounded before the Japanese finally uh, were defeated at Iwo Jima. From there... Iwo Jima opened the path to the invasion of Okinawa, uh, which is, now we're getting into, like, traditional Japanese territory. Now, Okinawa is not considered one of the four home islands, Hokkaido, Kyushu, Honshu, and I'm, I'm forgetting the fourth one off the, without, without looking, but, um, ultimately, uh, Okinawa is, uh, it's a slightly distinct culture from what they consider the four home islands, but it had been under Japanese control for hundreds of years. It's a part of the nation of Japan today. Uh, when we're getting into Okinawa, uh, you know, we're now talking about we're in Japan for, for all intents and purposes. The closest we ever came to a battlefield on the home islands. Uh, and so, uh, and the thing is, the invasion of Okinawa... Uh, becomes uh, a fight to the death. And the Japanese basically instructed uh, the people there at Okinawa I mean, to fight to the last man. They gave every man, woman, and child two grenades um, at one point during the Battle of Okinawa and said, you know, if the army goes down and it comes down to you guys, use one grenade to kill the Americans and another grade, uh, another uh, yourselves. I'm trying to shield the, the light here. Hold on. Let me see if I can... Doesn't look like... All right. We'll just be content. All right, so uh, Okinawa... Uh, Invasion starts in April the 1st of 1945. Um, uh, there was nearly 2,000 kamikazes uh, attacked the American fleet. You know, 2,000 kamikazes took out 5,000 Americans and sank 38 U.S. ships. Um, uh, a lot of civilians committed mass suicides when the Americans took over the island, so they would literally start jumping off of cliffs and stuff like that. Um, altogether, uh, yeah, it's 140,000 Okinawans committed suicide rather than be subject to, you know, control of a conquering allied, uh, you know, war machine. So, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the battle goes on two and a half months and it's as fearsome uh, as it can be. And what's crazy about Okinawa is it creates great fear of, you know, we're almost there. We, we've been trying to work toward an invasion of Japan. Now we're right on the doorstep, and we start thinking, oh, my Lord, is are we going to have to fight Okinawa like Okinawa from one end of Japan to the other? Because if we do there's going to be an awful lot of Americans dead. In fact, uh, a lot of military... Now, now, we'll talk in a minute about the atomic bomb and how it came about. A lot of historians will disagree and, and pick the numbers apart, but it is the case that the United States military was under the impression in 1945 that we, if we were going to invade the Japanese home islands, that we needed to be prepared for one million American casualties. One million. 
Now, the actual American casualty rate for the whole war as it played out in real life was uh, was in the hundreds of thousands. Like I, I want to say it was maybe 300,000. Uh, the stats are in another book I'll look at in a minute. Um, so we're talking about if, if those estimates are anywhere close to right, uh, an invasion of the Japanese homeland would have been, you know, uh, seven, eight times as costly as the whole war was. And, and so with that, uh, that made it a lot less of an ethical dilemma about whether to use the newest weapon in the American arsenal, which was something known as the atomic bomb. And uh, the atomic bomb uh, was a bomb that was developed um, based on, really, it was his ideas that were developed by Albert Einstein uh, really kind of helped make it happen, although Einstein was horrified by that. Ooh. Um, hold on. Stabilizing. Okay. Uh, so I've got I've got like a stool on top of a stool uh, that's holding my phone up right now. So Einstein was absolutely horrified by what happened with his science, but nonetheless he had at one moment in time and notified the government of the possibility of it. Uh, but it, the atomic bomb uh, works off of uh, the, um, you know, nuclear fission, uh, and, uh, and we don't need to get into all the specifics of it, of it right, a, right away, but the idea is, um, that this one bomb, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, extraordinarily, extraordinarily powerful. Let me pull up some, some, uh, stats here. Um... Let me try if the other textbook has the stats. I don't want to make them up. <laughs> but, uh, I, I think y'all are aware of how big a deal the atomic bomb was, but I still want to give you some numbers for perspective so that you understand just how big of a deal uh, that it is. So, um, and the guy in charge, so there was a scientific project known as the Manhattan Project. Uh, it was conducted by American intelligence, both in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, we exploded the first atomic bomb in a New Mexico desert in a test uh, on July 16th of 1945. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, we... Uh, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, we threatened the Japanese that if they did not surrender, they would deal with... Uh, quote, a rain of ruin from the air. Um, the Japanese didn't reply. August 6, 1945, we dropped an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima, which was a city of 350,000 people. Of those 350,000 people, 70 to 80,000 died in the attack, and many more that survived the bombing. Uh, that region developed an extraordinarily high cancer rate, really to the present day, um, as a result of the radiation lingering in the air. And so uh, it's possible that they actually killed many, many more people. Um, three days later, on August 9th, they dropped a second bomb on Nagasaki, which is a city of 270,000 people, and it killed 70,000 of them immediately. Uh, and then, like I said, both of those are like deaths from the actual explosion and the force, but radiation deaths exceeded that number tremendously in both cases. Uh, and so you just saw whole cities devastated. I'll send out a video uh, of some, some you know, footage of the aftermath. Some people will actually be surprised how much survived, you know, the atomic bomb explosion uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, you, know, uh, you know, some people kind of have this myth that, like, the entire city disintegrated. Well, I mean, there are parts of the city that really did look like that. Some others, you know, there were still some structures standing, oftentimes badly damaged. And then, obviously, you know, you still had, you know, some survivors. But, again, we're not talking about, like, a wave of, of planes coming in and driving. We're talking about one bomb. You're talking about one bomb killing uh, literally tens of thousands of people in an instant. In an instant, one second later, you know. Um... And the thing is, we could have done more damage. We actually exploded the bomb in the air, uh, you know, uh, miles 
uh, you know, above where it could have been if, if we had just dropped it straight onto the ground, we could have extended the blast radius tremendously. But we wanted to have some sympathy to the civil, civilian casualties. Um, and the question is, was it right or was it wrong to use the atomic bomb? Because the reality is most of those tens of thousands of people that died were not soldiers and were not fighting us directly. Um, and if you've ever, if, you know, if you've ever studied and looked at the conditions of the survivors, I mean, just god-awful scarring, unbelievable suffering. I mean, there's there's nothing good and playful about the you know the atomic bomb. I mean, it's it's a deep humanitarian tragedy. Uh, and we'll talk about in our next lecture as we kind of start to you know, especially for uh, the American history class. We'll get to it this week. The World War Two uh, World History class. Y'all kind of get to that at the beginning of next week. We'll talk about the way. Uh, that the nuclear bomb really scars the psyche of the whole world, including the Americans that dropped it. Like, we're, like, we win the war, and it's kind of this weird thing of, like, yay, we won the war. What did we just do? Uh, because people kind of thought, we have opened Pandora's box, and there's no way to get it back in there. Um, and, and, and in reality, we have done a pretty decent job of keeping... Uh, the nuclear weapons under control. I mean, if you'd have told someone in 1945 that we would be in 2020 and no one would have used another nuclear weapon in war again, I, I really don't think anyone would have believed you. Um, but the shock of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was so much that it really caused people to be very cautious, even in wars like Korea and Vietnam and so on, about using it. And it also um, probably is, in, in some people believe, uh, that it actually prevented war uh, from ever breaking out between the Americans and the Soviet Union, that uh, there was a theory known as mutually assured destruction or mad theory that said that, you know, that part of the reason peace was kept between America and Russia was because both sides knew that uh, to start a war with the other would lead to, uh, you know, their certain doom uh, for both sides. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, on one hand it worked, on the other hand this is not a, uh, you know, uh, a great recipe for everyone feeling really comfortable and at peace in the world when when everyone's uh, plan for keeping peace is mutually assured destruction of the entire globe, right? So, and and it should be said too when we get to the 50s, you know, they'll develop the hydrogen bomb, which is literally a hundred times more plus uh, more powerful than the atomic bomb that was dropped on Japan, which is astounding. Because you see that and you think it can't be worse than that. But then the hydrogen bomb that they come up with literally makes that look like child's play. Um, and so ultimately, uh, you know, with the devastation that's done to, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which are not irrelevant cities, by the way. Um, Nagasaki was, in particular, was an important uh, manufacturing city. Um, with that, it finally convinces Hirohito, the Japanese emperor, uh, to surrender and on a day that we called VJ Day, otherwise, uh, uh, let's see what the precise date was, September 2nd, on September 2nd of 1945, World War II came to a close, General Douglas MacArthur received the surrender of uh, the Japanese Emperor Hirohito uh, on the battleship, the USS Missouri, and that brought uh, World War II to a close. Okay, here are some stats in the book about the, the uh, impact of the bombing. Uh, the ground temperature at Hiroshima, so the temperature of the ground after the bomb hit, was 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 7,000 degrees. That is almost as hot as South Carolina in August. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, there were hur hurricane force winds uh, of 980 miles an hour. Now, remember the, the wild winds like a couple weeks ago, I think, that, you know, that took out some, some of these trees here in this uh, woods are, you know, down from, from the winds from a few weeks ago. But, you know, that was in the 20s, right? The, the, we were talking about the 980s. The energy that was released by the atomic bomb was the equivalent of uh, 20,000 tons of TNT. 20,000 tons of dynamite. Now, let me remind you that a ton is 2,000 pounds. So, 
you know, if you want to know how many pounds of dynamite, that's the equivalent of, that's 20,000 times 20,000. Uh, so I believe, if I'm not mistaken, if my math is right, that's 400,000. So think about 400,000 pounds of dynamite going off at once. That's the explosive power of the atomic bomb in 1945. And remember that the hydrogen bomb that we invented in the 50s, you know, is exponentially more destructive than the one that we dropped on Japan. Uh, 62,000 buildings were destroyed, 70,000 people were killed immediately, 140,000 more died by the end of 1945 after the radiation poisoning took its toll, and again, I mean, this region had abnormally high rates of cancer and other uh, radiation-affected illnesses all the way into uh, the last couple of decades. Uh, all told, they believe that the deaths related to the atomic bomb on Hiroshima was 210,000 people. That's just Hiroshima. That's not Nagasaki. Now, remember, this Japanese like refusal to surrender was so near to their heart that they they they, they still didn't quit after Hiroshima. You know, they had to they had to do it twice. And at that point, the Japanese were like, "Look, we don't know how many of these bombs that they have. I think they probably after the first one were kind of like, is there more where that came from?' When they found out that there was, you know, that was all she wrote." I actually don't know how many more we had. I think we only had a couple more that we could have used, but we'd figured out how to do it. More would have been made, although you can't just nonchalantly make an atomic bomb, and they're very expensive, right? Um, you know, a lot of time, money, and scientific engineering goes into making each individual one of them. But nonetheless, um, you know, uh, th there would have been more because we had learned, we'd gotten the recipe, so we would have made more. And... Um, you know, there's a very serious question about the ethics and morality of doing this. Should we have used the atomic bomb? The the case against it, I started to allude to this earlier and I got sidetracked. The case against it is just the humanitarian suffering, the number of civilian casualties, the number of women and children that were, you know, literally in some cases incinerated, in other cases died of horrific radiation poisoning. Uh, it was a terrible, terrible thing. And yet... At the same time, put yourself in the shoes of Harry Truman, who was the president who had to make the decision to use it or not. You know, you represent the good of the people of the United States. Uh, and you've got military advisors saying, if we land troops in Japan, we might lose a million of ours. And perhaps as many people would have died, and maybe as many Japanese people would have died in that invasion as died in the atomic bomb. Now, it might have been a little more focused on the soldiers, but we also saw what was happening in Okinawa. Would they have just started jumping off cliffs? Would they have started, you know, it's hard to say. So, you know, I tend to think that in that situation, President Truman kind of had to do what he had to do, and that if, uh, and that if he had... Put yourself, put yourself in the shoes of a mother who has a son fighting in the war. And you find out that President Truman had a secret bomb that could end the war in days. And he sat on it. And because of that, your son died in the war along with hundreds of thousands, even if we didn't reach a million, hundreds of thousands of other Americans. How would you feel about President Truman as a leader? You know. When you look at it that way, it's hard to see how he could have done anything else. But at the same time, um, man, I mean, some a terrible, terrible thing happened to the Japanese people and happened to the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But a lot of that also was because Japan did start the war, right? You know, if they had not decided to start invading first China and then pressing on into India, Philippines, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and then bombing Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and all that stuff, you know, if they hadn't decided to take over half the world you know, they wouldn't have been in that position. Uh, at the same time, I'm very sympathetic to people who say that something like that should never have been used. Uh, I just I just don't think that you can really put yourself in that same position uh, and, and make a different call than Truman made, I think, if you were alive at the time. It, it, it's easy for us to Monday morning quarterback. Um, nonetheless, I mean, you know, the invention of the atomic bomb is still a scary, scary thing. It's a scary, scary moment in world history. Um, even the Americans uh, were kind of like, what have we released in the earth? And as we'll see, for about five years, America has a monopoly on the atomic bomb, and we're relatively comfortable with that because we know we're not going to use it haphazardly. 
there were generals in wars like Korea and Vietnam that were asking us to use atomic weapons, asking permission of the president to use it. And, and presidents ever since have been like, no, are you an idiot? No. Uh, with every one of those requests, you know, it's even in the midst of actual shooting wars, the United States has typically kept a position of you only break out the atomic bomb in the most extreme circumstances, and it's never happened since. We've, we've not used an atomic weapon since 1945. Um, however, in 1950, a terrifying thing, or it might even be 1949, a terrifying thing happens, and that is that the Soviet Union gets the bomb as well. And once that happens, you now have one of the most evil regimes in the history of the world under the command of Joseph Stalin has nuclear weapons. And this leads to a several decades long period known as the Cold War of nuclear paranoia and fear where America and Russia are kind of playing chess with the world trying to become uh, trying to gain influence either for or against democracy and communism respectively and uh, and along the way everyone playing this game of international chess knows that in the background of it is nuclear annihilation uh, and, you know, and, and to this day, I mean, we we haven't seen a nuclear problem in a little while, but it still is the case that you know, you've got a country like Pakistan that has nuclear weapons that is a failed state where their leader uh, leadership uh, apparatus is really weak, where radical Islamists have been able to gain influences with Pakistani warlords and stuff at different times. You know, and you look at a case like that and you say, is it really impossible to think that, a, that some Islamic terror group could wind up, you know, with a nuclear weapon in their hands? It's not out of the question. And the fear that, um, we'll get to this much later uh, in the next couple of weeks, but, you know, the, the, you know, the fear that that could happen is what leads us to the Iraq war, because there was intelligence that seems to have been faulty. Uh, now it seems to have been wrong, but we believe that, you know, the dictator of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, was going to get nuclear weapons. You know, we were willing to invade the country to overthrow him to prevent that from happening because, you know, the idea of kind of all the countries of the world having nukes is kind of a terrifying thing. And so we've worked to kind of prevent the nuclear secrets from going out of a small group of nations. Unfortunately, within that small group of nations, you know, you have some bad actors like Russia and China in, involved in that. So, you know, you know, the nuclear, you know, you know, nuclear energy uh, is kind of, and the discovery of the atomic bomb is kind of a blessing and a curse. Uh, you know, it got us out of the war. <coughs> Excuse me. It got us out of the war, but at the same time, um, it really uh, scarred the conscience of the world for the rest of time. Uh, so just a couple uh, notes about the end of World War II in general. Um, some of what happens here, the if you look at like uh, you know the the final casualty counts of the war combined, um, you know the Americans had uh, 292,000 soldiers killed or missing, uh, the British 272,000, uh, the French had 205,000. Then you turn your attention to the Axis, you know, uh, the, J the Japanese lost 1.1 million people, uh, and the Germans lost 3.3 .3 million people. But no country came close. <coughs> no country came close to the same level of suffering as the Soviet Union did. 13.6 million people were killed or went missing on a, for the Soviet Union. So, uh, again, the second highest total was Germany with 3.3 .3 million uh, you know, dead or missing. The Soviets had 13, more than 10 million more. Uh, and so, and this has something to do with a communist government that just has no value for, you know, preserving life. And so strategically, you know, um, you know their commanders, the most famous of which was, uh, was Zhukov, uh, didn't really plan their strategies caring about preserving life. I uh, just kind of threw them at the problem. And so, uh, you know, the, the Russians, again, the Russians, what a terrible suffering. You're under the czar. You know, the czar is terrible. They drag you into World War One. You suffer worse than everyone else in World War I. Uh, the communists take over in the midst of that. You deal with Lenin. You deal with Stalin and the Great Purge and 
the the gulag archipelago uh, where they start sending the political prisoners um, persecuting um, you know people who, uh, who are either political dissidents or religious dissidents um, you know mass murders even of communist party members on account of Stalin then you go right into World War II where you lose 13 million people in World War II when we lose less than less than a half million and they lose 13 million uh, and then from there you're still under Stalin and he, he's still evil and he throws you into you know more armed conflicts ultimately so um, man uh, I really really pity the people that came up under the communist governments both in China and in Russia a truly truly terrible thing um, and so uh, in addition to that as far as uh, you know, the civilian toll, uh, the Russians also lost 7 million civilians. Uh, the Germans lost 3 million civilians. Um, but that includes, uh, that, that figure for the 3 million civilians includes um, those that were victims of the Nazi Holocaust and other things, which we'll, we'll do a whole other video about that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, as far as the economic toll, uh, the U.S. is the one that paid the most money into all this. Converting everything to 1994 money, which is when, I guess, the last figure when your book was printed, you know, the United States spent uh, $288 billion on the war. Uh, the Germans, $212 billion, um, and then everybody else uh, was under $200 billion. <clears throat> But nonetheless, I mean, even... Here's how here's how little pay a Russian soldier got. They lost 13.6 million people, but they only spent 93 billion on the war, uh, whereas the U.S. spent 288 billion on the war and only lost 292,000 people. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so ultimately, the end of the war uh, is going to uh, begin the period that we call the Cold War era. Uh, there's some trials are held at Nuremberg, Germany, uh, where those that took part in the Holocaust and some of these German atrocities uh, had to face justice. Maybe for the sake of time, since this video is getting long, we'll talk about that when we do the Holocaust video. Um, uh, and I was going to talk about the Yalta Conference at this one, but maybe we'll just allude to Yalta as we need to when we do the beginning of the Cold War video. So we'll just we'll just call it a day for, for now. So uh, anyway, uh, so this brings us to uh, the end of World War II, but unfortunately this is not the beginnings of world peace and harmony because this just moves us into the 50-year, give or take, uh, period of global instability known as the Cold War. Uh, and uh, so we will talk to you about that later. Have yourselves a good day.